What I call the World Game now is an exercise that I have been following through for a great many years. Can you hear me in Baccarat? And it started with my being in the United States Navy at the time of World War I. At that time, the Navy's represented investment of all the science, all the chemistry, all the physics, all the mathematics known about our universe. And I was shocked that it was only going in this negative thing of killing. We had this extraordinary technology. Men were not doing anything with that kind of accuracy on the land in relation to trying to make man a success. It became very quickly apparent that the fundamental raison date in all of our statecraft is based on Thomas Malthus. Now, Thomas Malthus was the scientific servant of the, the masters of the earth at the time. He's the first economist in the history of man to receive the total vital statistics from around the spherical earth. And in 1800, he wrote his first book, which he said, apparently, man was reproducing himself much more rapidly than producing goods to support himself. Therefore, very sad, but man is supposed to be a failure. Shall we inform the whole world, the whole world at that time being more than 90% illiterate and unable to then to even read any information that was sent to them? Should we try to inform the whole world there's nowhere nearly enough to go around, we divide up evenly and all that slowly together? And that, 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 that didn't seem logical to them at all. They said, what we can do is the following. All these people out here are ignorant of what we know about, and because they're ignorant, they think they have some hope. And we know they don't have hope, most of them. Why, why eliminate their hope that they're going to die, poor characters, and you might just as well let, let them die in ignorance? And, and ignorance and hope. And this is the kindest thing to do. And that's exactly what they did there. So can I get anything before we get started? I think I'm good. All right, feel free to take a seat. How are we doing on tech? Almost there. All right, well, let's, let's go ahead and roll for basic info and we'll, uh, we'll just we'll tweak it as we go. Sound? Speed. And roll in. All right, so please go ahead and introduce yourself and state your work. My name is Malika Soyanka, and I'm a professor of history at Columbia University. My specialty of interest surrounds what most historians call today the Great Transition, that period of time between the 21st and early 22nd century where global society underwent a rather spectacular social revolution? <laughs> That's a good question. I guess time will tell. All right, let's, let's inch into this. Please uh, state your name, vocation, and how you found interest in economics. I'm Cynthia Flores, and I received an interdisciplinary degree in systems ecology and economics from the University of Cape Town, where I also now teach. I guess I would start by saying that I can't think of anything more relevant to the character of society than its economic foundation. Hello, I'm Alenia Demir, and I teach epidemiology at the University of Istanbul. Epidemiology is the study of public well-being, or what one could call population-level phenomena, specifically the distribution of physical and mental health across society. With respect to your documentary, I would say the period before the Great Transition likely marked the most unhealthy and unstable period in human history. So am I looking at you or the camera? At me. Got it. Uh, whenever you're ready. I'm Vivian Marcella, and I'm a sociocultural biologist, which simply means I try to better understand the synergies that mold human behavior, and by extension culture. I joined the Center for Behavioral Studies in Oslo in 2115, and I continue to try to make sense of this lovable mess we call humanity. There's an exercise I often do with my first-year students. 
I have them research mainstream economic publications from the 16th to the 21st century, trying to find any mention of basic sustainability principles. And each year the students come back stunned by how this period gave no priority to even the most obvious regenerative science, let alone anything related to public health. Such things were considered external to this contrived competitive game they called business. Here you had an entire global civilization powering itself through the mechanism of consuming. That's literally what drove their economy, as absurd as that sounds. And the more people bought and consumed, the more demand for jobs. Hence, more circulating purchasing power to, again, be spent on consuming. Endlessly and viciously repeating. That was the economic system back then. And to think any part of that would be workable in the long run on a finite planet is pure lunacy. To make matters worse, the system was rooted in strategic human exploitation, which structurally ensured large wealth and power differences between groups. And the long-term cultural result was very poor social integrity. Racism, xenophobia, sexism, and other forms of bigotry were an inevitable side effect of this kind of social system, ultimately rooted in class stratification, otherwise known as socioeconomic inequality. And when you put it all together, you realize a deep social pathology. A pathology that not only severely limited human potential, actually bringing out the worst of our biological and social nature, but one that was blindly pushing civilization toward oblivion due to accelerating ecological decline and systemic human conflict. By the time we reach the 21st century, the consequences of all this weren't subtle. We're talking massive global inequity and poverty, relentless worldwide conflict, endless power abuses and systematic oppression, not to mention the near irreversible decline of all life support systems. And while it seems obvious to us today, you have to understand the kind of indoctrination that occurred back then. The culture was so conditioned by the dominant worldview, they just couldn't recognize the flaws inherent to the structure of their society. So by force of this, they engaged in very superficial activism, centered around political institutions that really were just a parody of themselves. Attempts at social change were deeply fragmented in focus because people's understanding of cause and effect was so shallow. So the whole thing just became a spectacle, an endless blame game between groups. Their so-called democratic process centered not on actual policy, but around these political institutions that seemed to vaguely represent such policy. A true democracy, as we now know, allows for public consensus on actual issues, not the appointment of representatives to make those decisions for them. That's not really democracy at all, that's simply a watered-down version of authoritarianism, voting for kings and queens. And to add insult to injury, because society was rooted in this business system of property and trade, everything was for sale. People loved to argue about moral lines and ethics, but the fact was, politicians, and hence policy, was just another commodity to be bought and sold. So inevitably, those who did end up with true social power were the ones with the most wealth. That wasn't a corruption, that was simply the nature of the system. And needless to say, this business power subculture was certainly the least likely to want to change the very system that had so disproportionately rewarded them. And as science and technology increased efficiency, creating higher material standards of living in general, the lack of human rights progress and the anti-democratic nature of society became increasingly masked. People's dignity and integrity were bought off by gadgets and toys and addictions, feeding a materialist fetish that so distracted the minds of many. And you know, I often ponder all this, trying to put myself in the shoes of the average person back then, especially in the more affluent and highly unequal regions, such as the United States of America. And it really makes me shudder. People stuck in traffic, piling into these office prisons to push paper around, engaging meaningless occupations that wasted far more energy and wealth than they created so they can continue buying these things they don't need, elevating their artificial status and so on. It's like a bad horror movie. If there's any historical through line that reveals how important a system-based worldview is, both in understanding society and knowing how to change it, it's the long history of slavery and human exploitation. You can't have a society that's based upon hierarchical power and specialized labor, where people are seen as economic tools to be used strategically for another's differential gain. 
and ever expect high moral integrity. Consider the function of cost efficiency. Cost efficiency is about trying to save money on production in order to maximize profit upon final sale. It's at the core of the basic gaming strategy that's required in market economics. And that simple incentive, the principle of seeking to reduce input costs to maximize output gains, is at the root of thousands of years of human slavery in one form or another. Whether indentured servitude, bonded labor, chattel slavery in earlier times, to human trafficking and debt-driven wage slavery in more modern times. And the point to make here is that this kind of framework was so normalized by the turn of the 21st century, a period, by the way, that had more slaves in absolute numbers than any time in human history, the average person still didn't see the connection. They had been conditioned by these mythical free market ideas, arguing that because people could now choose which area of the economy to submit their labor to, choose which company to be subordinated, or perhaps get the capital and start their own company, and then choose who to exploit for their own personal advantage. Somehow coercion just no longer existed. That was the illusion. And any advanced technological society that evolves not to organize in an effort to provide basic life support to its citizens, allowing them to pursue their own interests on their own terms, instead structurally forcing everyone to fight with each other for basic survival, for no defendable reason, mind you, is not a free society at all. It's a system of violence and oppression, regardless of how materially wealthy that society may appear. So you wrote a book called The Neolithic Maladaptation, which focuses on the nature of culture before the Great Transition. Can you clarify what you meant by this title? Sure. So I think the defining question of civilization is what characteristics enable us to survive and prosper sustainably and peacefully over generational time. Thousands of years ago, upon the advent of agriculture, the Neolithic Revolution, we found ourselves in a new social arrangement, a new structure, one that would later prove to be highly incompatible. Not only incompatible with the habitat, inherently unsustainable since the economy literally required consumption and growth, but also incompatible with our very social nature. And long story short, humans are simply not meant to exist in an economically stratified society if the expectation is high levels of public health and peaceful coexistence. It's always interesting to review the work of mainstream scientists at the turn of the 21st century as they desperately try to convince themselves that a competitive, exploitative, vainly status-seeking mindset was an inalterable expression of human nature. When the fact is, our genes, our biology, and how the environment interacts with our evolved selves allows for vast range of orientations with narrow self-interest, greed, merely part of that range. If we've proven to be anything, it's adaptable. There's certainly no blank slate. We're not infinitely malleable. But it has been grossly underestimated historically just how wide our range of adaptive potential really is, and what most determines which behavioral traits will define a society's culture is its social structure. Or more specifically, that structure's economic basis, the method by which we must survive. If that structure rewards competition, dominance, and narrow self-interest, then the culture will predominantly express those values. If it rewards collaboration, empathy, and pro-social concern, the resulting culture will predominantly express those values. For the majority of human history, before the advent of agriculture, we lived in non-hierarchical, non-competitive social arrangements. Why? Because the economic basis of survival actually incentivized sharing and collaboration and not the opposite. So what I mean by maladaptation is while humanity did successfully adapt to the survival requisites born from the Neolithic Revolution, the resulting social structure, the system that became codified, proved maladapted. The economic system was simply incompatible with what was required for humanity to be sustainable in the long term, failing our need to integrate properly with the ecosystem while limiting our ability to coexist peacefully with each other. And by the time of the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century, these flaws were rapidly coming to the surface. Conditions had changed. And if it wasn't for our dramatic transformation to break out of that system, there is little question. Society would have seen total ecological collapse combined with catastrophic global war. 
So it must be difficult to look back at that time, given what we know now. It seems like things should have changed much sooner, right? Sure. But it reveals that as much as we'd like to believe we're rational, objective beings, we're actually bound by deep social vulnerability. We are social beings first, and intellectual beings second. What you see back then is a kind of mass hypnosis that paralyzed society, keeping people short-sighted and fearful, prone to conform to the values and practices of those who happen to be winning in the contrived economic game. One glance at the media from back then gives it all away. Status posturing, people obsessed with appearing affluent, accomplished, loved, famous, beautiful, all a kind of pathological emulation of those of high socioeconomic status, billionaires, celebrities. As one notable philosopher stated long ago, it is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. So once again, it all begs the question, what actually defines success in the human condition? What kind of culture is most optimized to sustain itself over time, while of course being happy and stable? And while there's plenty to learn, we do know what doesn't define it. The excessive, materialistic wealth and status-driven neurosis so characteristic back then has literally zero positive relationship to long-term species sustainability and optimized public health. In short, the values were dead wrong. And not to sound mean, but if I were to resort to derisive status labeling common to that period of time, there's no question that the greatest failures were the ones who owned mansions, drove overpriced cars, wore luxury jewelry, maintained extremely lucrative yet completely meaningless occupations while hoarding great wealth. What kind of sad, insecure creature needs to flaunt such excess, clearly signaling opposition to other people's well-being? True success is reinforcing harmony, balance. The goal is not necessarily to become something, but to find out who and what you truly are and how you fit inside the ecosystem of nature that gave birth to you. The most successful people, the true winners, are never the ones striving for celebrity and material excess. They are the humble minimalists, valuing how they can contribute to the well-being and health of everything, realizing the world is one system. And the more they optimize that contribution, the more truly successful they actually become. When I look back on all this, I think what I find most tragic is the spiritual loss of the individual, how people were fundamentally alienated from themselves, their identities hijacked by competitive insecurity, trying to conform to some acceptable profile that would serve their advantage best, not who they actually are, but what the system requires them to become. So earlier, something was said to the effect that humans are not designed to exist in an economically stratified society. So to speak, yes. A stratified society is far more unhealthy and unstable when compared to an egalitarian one. But it seems like a pretty bold conclusion. Can you elaborate? Sure. Consider our biology, specifically the human brain. We're profoundly wired for social response. For instance, the same brain centers that react to physical pain also react to emotional pain, such as feeling rejected, excluded, or shamed. In early life, socially isolated infants not receiving proper affection will fail to produce critical growth hormones, harming development, while in adulthood, similar effects occur. For example, there were these dehumanizing institutions called prisons and they practice solitary confinement, severe social isolation, and that practice literally caused brain damage. Now, what do these examples have in common? They are negative responses to social-related stress. And when you review the past 200 years of epidemiological study on the issue, you realize that an economically stratified society is one of the most toxically stressful conditions you could ever impose upon the human species. We've all learned about the horrors of abject poverty, a condition that affected a billion people at the turn of the 21st century, causing literally millions of deaths each year. But the negative effects of economic stratification aren't limited to the distinctly poor. Inequality harms just about everyone, a kind of social pollution. And the lower one finds themselves on the stratified ladder, the worse their health becomes on average. 
Consider a lower class mother working two jobs, in debt, can't afford a car, living paycheck to paycheck, while trying to take care of her young child. They may not be homeless, starving, or even poor by legal standards, but every day is still a battle to make ends meet. This is known as relative poverty, or more formally, low socioeconomic status. And a defining characteristic of this condition on average is high psychosocial stress, meaning stress related to social factors. This stress includes not only feelings of general insecurity, such as worrying about paying your bills, affording your child's next doctor visit, or losing your job, but also the stress of social status itself. How one feels about themselves compared to others. And while that particular aspect may seem trivial, the fact is, our brains have evolved to react in profoundly specific ways when it comes to how we think others see us. We have an acute sensitivity to our perceived social status. In other words, it's not just about the stress of endless worry and the technical difficulty of being poor that's toxic. It's equally, if not more, about the stress of feeling poor. For example, studies have shown, if you take people with the same equal access to free healthcare controlling for lifestyle factors, you will still see, as you inch down the ladder of income and wealth, people's health getting progressively worse on average. The lower they are in the class hierarchy, the sicker they become. One mechanism for this is that high psychological stress leads to a state of chronic inflammation and what's called an allostatic overload. Allostasis means your body's trying to recover from something, working to return to a more balanced state. But it can't. And this causes the body and the mind to wear down rapidly, living in relative poverty in all its day-to-day -day insecurity and feelings of low self-worth keeps people psychologically locked in a stressful state, ravaging mental and physical health. Consider heart disease. Low socioeconomic status creates a 50% greater chance of its development. And not just because people may have poor lifestyle habits, but due to psychosocial stress itself, which increases the hormone cortisol damaging arteries, fostering strokes and heart attacks. Low socioeconomic status is a heart disease risk factor on its own, similar for diabetes and cancer, with far higher rates for those relatively poor. As one study put it, poverty itself is a carcinogen. And given that heart disease, diabetes, and cancer were some of the leading causes of death in that highly unequal global society of the early 21st century, these facts help explain why lifespan gaps between the rich and the poor were shockingly wide ranging from 15 to 40 years, depending on region. And then you have mental health. Low socioeconomic status fuels much higher instances of depression, anxiety disorders, schizophrenia, suicide, not to mention violence, including child abuse. The condition of poverty was found to be the leading predictor of child abuse, which is particularly troubling since such abuse often leads to adult disorders such as addictions, antisocial behavior, immune system problems, cognitive impairment. In fact, it was found that children simply living in the condition of poverty correlated to large decreases in IQ, decreased brain development, and worse overall health throughout the life cycle. Personally, I would argue that if child abuse is about negligence and harm, any society that tolerates the existence of poverty, when it has the means to end it, is a society that is fundamentally abusive to children. Now, as far as behavioral violence in general, it's no surprise the pre-transition period was saturated in it. The emotional pathogen behind most acts of violence is shame, and inequality produces shame like a finely tuned machine. Shootings, gang violence, terrorism, domestic violence, all highly correlated to inequality, like a toxic cloud hovering over civilization. The more economically unequal a society, the more violent it tended to be on average. And that goes for most everything in terms of negative public health outcomes, with higher incidences of disease, crime, obesity, infant mortality, homicides, teen birth, mental illness, poor education, conflict, domestic abuse, illiteracy, suicide, premature mortality, overall mistrust, and much more. There is no viable defense of its existence on any level, and it's certainly not representative of a fixed human nature. Humans are basically allergic to socioeconomic stratification. In the end, 
it wasn't the so-called communist, socialist, anarchist, or whatever counterculture group that posed the most serious argument for the Great Transition. It was the environmental scientists. One could debate the ins and outs of morality, public health, and human rights. But if the habitat goes, all that becomes moot. And at the turn of the 21st century, our ecological negligence was pretty embarrassing. With great inefficiency, we were using far more resources each year than the planet produced. Had destroyed vast realms of biodiversity, polluted the air, the soil, the water. Not only destabilizing the entire global ecosystem, but by extension, society itself. The most common question I get when teaching this history is, how is it even possible things could get so bad? How could everyone just keep blindly pulling levers on that destructive economic machine and not see what was happening? And it comes down to a kind of faith-based conditioning, a religious pathology taking the form of mass economic behavior. The doctrine was that of universal scarcity. People had been taught to believe that at no time, under no circumstance, can economic balance exist. The very idea an economy could be organized to efficiently provide for everyone, while also being in balance with the habitat, was a sacrilegious taboo. The cult of scarcity and consumption wasn't having it. They considered it utopian thinking, supporting the myth that people had infinite wants and were acquisitively insatiable. Hence, the poor had to exist, and if anything was the problem, it must be population, not the system. That was the prevailing dogma. There must be too many people. You can't have ecological balance in a system that requires constant consumer activity to work. It's one thing to consume based on need. It's another to consume because the system demands it. And the market system of economics needed constant turnover of goods to keep and create jobs, providing workers, which of course were also consumers, with income to spend back into the system, endlessly repeating the cycle of cyclical consumption. If it didn't repeat fast enough or slowed, the economy contracted. Purchasing power wasn't circulating, and the society proceeded to shut down. A very unique historical moment occurred in the early 20th century, when it was realized that technology was now creating a good surplus, and great confusion ensued. The problem was this newfound productive efficiency was not being met by people buying more stuff. So two competing perspectives emerged. On one side, you had idealists envisioning a new era. If we can produce an overall goods surplus, why not lower the costs of goods, respectively, reducing work hours and increase pay in proportion? So you can now have, say, a person working only two days a week without losing their standard of living, since the market value of labor and goods adjusted to compensate for the increased efficiency. This logic makes perfect sense when it comes to the basic principle of supply and demand. Suddenly people have more free time, not buried in debt. They can enrich their social life, family life, and pursue the things that have true meaning. Well, that's not the way it played out, nor would it ever. Which brings us to the system level perspective, since the system itself simply isn't designed inherently for a steady state equilibrium. Market economics is predicated on a more is better ethic. To be competitive in the quest for market share, that's what's incentivized. More growth, more sales, more employees, more capital accumulation, more profit, constant expansion. So what happened was to be expected. Fortifying a new industry, commercial advertising. What was once a simple media service notifying people of new goods they may need turned into a powerful form of manipulative propaganda. In the later stages, companies spent more money on advertising than they did on research and development. What advertising does is abuse our social nature by making people feel like they're missing out. They're not good enough without this, they're low in status without that. They feel excluded from others if they don't own something. And as pathetic as all that sounds, it had a profound effect on society, with everyone keeping up with the Joneses. And a hideous feedback loop. And the result, as industrial productivity still continued to rise, people worked more than ever, had less free time, were in staggering amounts of debt, and arguably had a lower standard of living when you actually account for human happiness and the level of stress people endured, all to keep the economic machine moving. One thing that's really interesting in all this is that the economic system back then embraced a fantastic paradox. So here you had a model 
that defended itself by the assumption of universal scarcity, forcing competition, oppression, exploitation, poverty, and so on. While at the same time, the entire machine needed infinite consumption to work. Think about that for a moment. How do you justify these harsh outcomes of assumed scarcity when the system itself disregards the idea entirely, when it comes to the very mechanics that make it work? And the bottom line is, this wasn't an economy at all, by definition. It was an anti-economy, with human beings functioning like cancer cells, eating the Earth alive. In systems theory, this is known as a positive feedback loop. <laughs> Don't let that word positive confuse you, as there's nothing positive about it. It means there's nothing working to balance system behavior to its regulatory environment. That environment, in the case of economics, is a finite planet with a delicate ecosystem. If respect for our scarcity was taken seriously, the goal would be to focus on efficiency, working to reduce resource use, reduce waste in the process of meeting human needs. Manifesting, of course, a culture that's mature enough to understand the boundaries of its own existence. Truly positive economic metrics are the opposite of what was sought back then. Degrowth, so to speak, would be the goal. Doing more with less and needing less. People would go on TV to give an economic report and say something like, Great metrics for the economy this month. We reduced our use of energy and raw materials by another 3%, lowering sales once again with less need for human employment, increasing overall efficiency by a factor of two. We continue to be in homeostatic balance with the planet for yet another year, and humanity has more free time than ever. Here's Tom with the weather. Well, it's clear skies across the hemispheres. The Amazon rainforest isn't on fire. We aren't clogging the atmosphere with CO2, and we haven't seen swarms of refugees cascading across continents in search of food for some time. And the fog of billionaire douchebaggery seems to have cleared a bit. We do expect some precipitation, adding to our already abundant fresh water supply, further improving topsoil, while global abundance measures has everyone sitting pretty for the foreseeable future. Yeah, you would never hear anything like that. Instead, the opposite. Some dickhead PhD Ivy League market economist religious fanatic who literally has no clue what the word economy even means would come on and say, quarterly earnings were down last month in most sectors as GDP slows. We're seeing an increase in unemployment due to the contraction, but hopefully the coming Christmas season will spark new consumer demand while it's anticipated that the central bank will lower interest rates and buy more bonds to increase liquidity to ease the credit crunch. Hopefully, this will improve consumer confidence, inspiring investors to reallocate capital into da 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 Translated, this means we need you people to take on more loans, go into more debt, to buy more things, to create more jobs, so we can sell more things and use more of the Earth's resources. If we're lucky, industry will improve on shortening good lifespans through planned obsolescence, make things impossible to repair. Hopefully more single-use goods will become the norm so people can buy and throw away at an ever-increasing rate. Keeping this shit show going. shift gears here a bit and ask you about your work in group identity, specifically how it relates to economic conditions. Well, like everything is complex. As we talked about earlier, our social nature can get the best of us, and we have some interesting evolutionary wiring when it comes to groups. Us and them, in groups and out groups, and perhaps what's most unique is what defines an us and what defines a them is subjective and culturally dependent. If you grow up only being exposed to people who look like you, and then you're exposed to those that don't, your brain tends to fire with apprehension. But the same thing also occurs with something even more trivial, like baseball caps. You show people who like a certain team photos of that team, and then throw in a photo of an opposing team member, the same thing occurs. So for whatever evolutionary reason, we have a propensity to divide society up and make judgments. And there is no value in it whatsoever. It's just dangerous baggage. And before the great transition, because the economy was fundamentally divisive due to its competitive nature, bigotry and group oppression was a huge problem. 
So you have the human species developing in pockets around the world with different environmental exposures, not only shaping appearance, such as color of skin, but also setting in motion cultural differences. And as these groups began to mix, it got very messy, which is why you see, especially by the 20th century, strong social movements by people trying to stop group oppression, at least on the legal and political level. The demand for gender, ethnic, sexual orientation, and create equality was constant, with modest success given the fact society was still stuck in an economic mode based upon mutual exploitation, amplifying the tendency for group antagonism. But there was a side effect to all of this. Rather than seeking equality to neutralize the group identity problem, many chose to embrace it. They took what was an artificial construct imposed upon them and defined themselves by it. For example, someone descended from the African slave trade in America is only a black person via the construct of being called so. There is no such thing as a black person, just as there's no such thing as a gray person, just as there is no such thing as a white person. These are all social constructs that have been invented to artificially categorize people. And the same applies to culture. Just as there is no such thing as a white person, there is no such thing as an Italian person or a Buddhist person or an Irish person or a Jewish person. It is one thing to have a valued practice, meditation or sense of philosophy that inspires you and educates you. History is rich with beautiful traditions across many belief systems. Dogma aside, religion itself helps to serve as a kind of gateway into our spiritual and intellectual evolution. Finding meaning in meditation or putting up a Christmas tree or lighting a menorah creates ritualistic connection that can have great personal meaning. But engaging Buddhist practice doesn't make you Buddhist. Being born from a bloodline in Italy doesn't mean you're an Italian, and going to church doesn't mean you're Christian. The moment you go from a person that enjoys the practice of something to saying, I am this or that, is the moment you draw dangerous lines through the species. Taking such pride in your ethnic, religious, or regional background creates an identity with the group by label, and it is fundamentally elitist and bigoted by nature. There is only one race, the human race, and within the confines of that fact, to separate yourself any further leads to absolutely nothing positive. So I'd like to go back to the subject of inequality, but this time to understand the mechanics of the oppression, how the hierarchy was kept in place. Okay, let's start with money. Money was the infrastructure of the market economy, and how it was created and moved around was instrumental to lower class oppression. So you had these things called banks, and they had the ungodly power to make abstract value out of nothing. If a person needed money for a home, or car, or business, they went to their local bank and applied for a loan. And if approved, the person signed a contract, binding them to return that loaned money at a future date. Though, it's not really a loan, in the sense of somebody lending out what they already owned. Contrary to what most assumed, banks didn't loan out money they actually had. They instead created new money in the form of credit, backed by debt. So, on one side, money represented a store of value people could spend, while on the other, it was a liability made out of debt. In other words, for every dollar that existed, there was also a debt of a dollar owed to some bank somewhere. That was how money was brought into existence, and when someone repaid the loan debt, the money then disappeared. That understood, any kind of service in that economy sought a profit. And in the case of a loan, that came in the form of a fee called interest. So the borrower not only had to eventually repay the loan, but also the interest charged as well. Imagine an island of 100 people. They decide to organize themselves through market economy. They plop a bank down and each of them take a loan for 100 credits of money at 10% interest. So they all now have 10,000 credits total in their money supply and they begin to work and exchange, creating economic activity. When the time comes to pay back the loan, they realize they owe not only the 100 credits, but the 10% interest, so 110 credits. Same for the whole society. In total, everyone on the island now owes the bank 11,000 credits. But yet, 
only 10,000 actually exist in the money supply. There is now more debt owed than money in existence due to the interest charge. So three things can happen. One, those short can take on more loans to temporarily cover the old ones, postponing the problem. Two, people could ramp up competitive trade, increasing economic activity to try to get enough from others to cover the debt, displacing the debt responsibility like a game of musical chairs. Or three, the bank comes in and takes real property to compensate for the outstanding debt, which is inevitably what happens somewhere down the line anyway. Wait, that, that can't be right. That would just be a system of organized theft. Yes. Banks were vehicles of creation on one side, and a system of organized theft and class oppression on the other. But in a large, complex global society, one based on economic growth, money moves so rapidly it was very hard for the mechanics of this to be recognized. Obscured by things like the boom and bust cycle, monetary expansion and contraction. Please. Continue. So back to our island again. But this time, for the sake of simplicity, let's remove the interest fee from the equation and focus only on the outcomes of competitive trade itself. So the 10,000 credits of money has been moving around through trade, labor, investment, starting businesses, hiring employees, and as is inevitable to the game, some businesses will outperform, winning disproportionate income, while others will fall behind, losing income. And naturally, those with more money can then increase their gaming advantage, becoming ever more competitive and, of course, more prone to keep winning. As the old adage went, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. A small business with limited means simply can't compete with a larger one that can outperform them in the same service due to having more resources to work with. So on our island, we see an inevitable point in time where, say, 10% of that population managed to acquire 90% of the island's wealth, while the other 90% of the population now has only 10%. By the way, this isn't some arbitrary assumption. This can be modeled mathematically. The dynamics of mass competitive trade in any society always moves toward disequilibrium. So back to my point. When you put this together, a displaced debt burden and the application of interest, you can begin to see the insidiousness, an economic process based upon competitive advantage and trade that inevitably consolidates wealth, increasing that advantage, coupled with a financial system that is charging interest on loans that can never be fully repaid. So it's no surprise that in the early 21st century, the global economy had about 200 trillion in debt and only 80 trillion in outstanding currency. While in the United States, then considered the richest nation on the planet, half of the population had less than $1,000 in savings, while also spending more each year than they actually earned, just trying to keep up. While on the global level, nearly 50% of the population lived in poverty on less than $5.50 a day, as roughly 30 individuals, yes, 30, owned more wealth than the bottom half, 3.6 billion. Now, there are plenty of other intermittent things that contribute to this disparity. Offshore tax havens for the rich, the mythology of trickle-down economics where government favors business over the public's well-being, gaming strategies to restrict the power of unions and keep wages low, various shenanigans related to this thing called the stock market. But the financial system and its use of debt is really the foundation of it all. Wow. You would expect riots in the street if people really understood that. Well, there eventually were, but again, at the time, people just couldn't see it. But no, it wasn't until the complete abolition of debt on all levels that human slavery finally ended on this planet. Speaking of awareness, I'd like to talk a little about how the awakening started. I know Concordia was instrumental to technical change later on, but what about before that, perhaps starting in the 20th century? Well, it's sporadic. The largest move against this system was the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, inspired by a man named Karl Marx. That brought about the Soviet Union, which existed for a couple decades, and it employed a top-down regulation system they called communism, but it proved to be inefficient and oppressive. It was also wildly opposed by Western capitalist powers, which sought to destroy it by any means necessary. Criticism was generally infused with civil rights movements. For example, Mahatma Gandhi who helped liberate India from colonial rule, was notably against the system. 
recognizing its creation of poverty, once saying that poverty was the worst form of violence. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was also steadfast against capitalism, seeing it as a part of a system of oppression, fueling racism. Same for the Black Panther Party. That had chapters all over the world in the 1960s. You also had more academic-minded organizations, like the technocracy movement, largely inspired by famous economist Thorsten Veblen, who recognized that a society run by business people was a very bad idea. And by the 21st century, when economic inequality was reaching unprecedented extremes, coupled with a growing ecological crisis, many more were realizing something had to be done. But there is one that sticks out to me in the context of the value system disorder present at the time. An iconic speech given by a man named Omar Badillo. Omar was born in poverty in Los Angeles, California. And as a young man, he just happened to win the largest state lottery ever in 2037. And he decided to use that money to solve the vast homeless crisis in his hometown. He funded nonprofits, established housing, treatment centers, not only getting people off the streets, but really helping them recover and acclimate something that hadn't been done before. And they gave him a Nobel Peace Prize for it. But what he had to say during his speech wasn't exactly what they expected. Mine damer och herrar, det är en glädje för oss att önska välkommen till vinnaren av Nobels fredpris, Omar Hadeo. Thank you. And while I'm happy for those we have helped over the past few years, taking about 75,000 homeless off the Los Angeles streets, I must say that the problem at hand runs much deeper than the poverty we see around us. When I created this program, focusing on just this one regional crisis, my long-term hope was that it would set a new precedent, that those who disproportionately benefit in this world would be inspired, step up, and help take responsibility for the plight of the less fortunate. After all, what I have done here is merely a patch that can only help a few. For the true source of poverty, our social system continues to go unaddressed. We live in a world of stories and myths, and we've been told that the vast inequities that we see is the price we must pay for innovation and progress. Well, innovation to what end? And how do we define this notion of progress? For if progress is about how much one can own, the availability of jobs, the state of a nation's GDP, the rise of the stock market, or the development of some gadget to entertain and distract you, then we face a serious existential crisis. I submit that true progress can only be measured in the health, stability, integrity, and responsible freedom of a civilization, responsible to ourselves, responsible to each other, and responsible to the earthly habitat we all share. And by those measures, my friends, there is now little progress to be found. As we all sit idly by, presupposing that the way society works is the only way it ever could. That said, if it's true that we must persist in this inhumane economic order, an order that has proven it can only create affluence for a minority at the cost of destitution for the majority, then our only choice is to seek a new level of humanitarian effort. Today, three people have more wealth than the bottom 75% of the world's population. Six billion people. The total wealth of the 4,000 billionaires out there have the means to end global poverty a hundred times over. And yet, if you study their philanthropy, it is clear that they are far more concerned with their own interests, their own comforts, than working to counter this ongoing structural violence. You see, there's a deeper kind of poverty here. A spiritual poverty. A poverty that grows a culture of sociopaths. And the more they have, the more they want. And the less they seem to care otherwise. Moral bankruptcy, hiding behind this age-old story that one can have a billion dollars in the bank while others starve, is somehow natural to the human condition. In a number of months, my program will end, as the funds will be gone. And to date, not 
One wealthy so-called philanthropist has offered to help keep the program running. Now I know this event is about peace, but it must be understood that the wealthy of this world, those at the root of true political power, are sick. Their priorities have nothing to do with true progress, and the time for tolerance is over. The billionaires of this world are not symbols of success. They are symbols of violence. And until that violence ends, there will be no peace on this planet. Centuries ago, humans discovered hydrocarbon energy, fossil fuels, and for a good chunk of time, it was a critical mechanism advancing civilization. But after a while, it became obvious that its continued use posed insurmountable repercussions, damaging the environment. So we eventually had to stop using it completely, figuring out other means. And this is a good analogy as to why we also needed to transcend that social system. I look at capitalism as an adolescent stage in the growth of civilization. Let's let loose and have people be selfish, building and creating in a belligerent manner with no regard for consequences. And we learned a lot. I think without this phase, we wouldn't have been able to recognize and amplify what really makes us unique as a species. We started as DNA, moving from simplicity to complexity, evolving a brain with consciousness while blessed with a profound social nature, merging us into a truly global consciousness continuing this expansion. Not through our biology, but through the sharing of knowledge, cultural evolution. There was a great library in a city called Alexandria long, long ago, and it contained some of the most foundational texts of human civilization. And sadly, it was destroyed in war. Many centuries later, a famous astronomer named Carl Sagan commented on the subject. It was as if the entire civilization had undergone some self-inflicted brain surgery and most of its memories, discoveries, ideas, and passions were extinguished irrevocably. So the great question of scientific and hence economic progress inevitably becomes how do we optimize the power of our group mind to increase knowledge and solve problems? How do we harness our different talents and skills to bring out our best potential? Not only as individuals, but as a civilization. We know the hardware, so to speak. A finite yet profoundly regenerative planet, bound by laws of nature. With our species, part of a delicate ecosystem, sharing common ground. The true measure of economic progress is simply doing more with less. Efficiency. The ability to build something for a given purpose that is not only better than what came before it in utility, but also better in terms of reducing the amount of labor, energy, and resources required to make it work. Which means it all comes down to design. And back to my point about markets. The infrastructure it created set the groundwork for powerful new means to merge human talent and skill. We just needed to remove the counterproductive aspects. And needless to say, wasteful human competition, proprietary knowledge, and people motivated to sell things over and over to feed a system of infinite growth wasn't going to work. There had to be a way to bridge minds and solve problems directly, not by proxy of market competition and profit. I think the smartest thing we ever did as a society was the adoption of an open source, shared resource commons. It exponentially catapulted our problem-solving creativity. We ended corporations, localized communities, and shared all knowledge. In fact, if it wasn't for that move, I really don't think we would have solved the climate crisis and all the other ecological and social problems we faced before the Great Transition. I still stand in awe today at the stunningly productive collective design processes we created, where a status is driven not by differential competition for gain, but by the degree of your contribution. How dedicated you are to problem solving and creation, working to improve the fabric of society itself. We also realized the true purpose of a means of production based upon automated technology. 
not as some brute industrial mechanism to produce an endless stream of arbitrary goods, but as a way to free ourselves from uncreative labor, not to mention improving efficiency and safety. And one final evolution worth noting was the removal of the price system. People stuck these numbers on everything that suggested some kind of earthly value. The numbers were a result of a particularly crude equation dealing with supply and demand. And while the high priests of the market religion saw those price decrees as the word of God, the truth was any price value determined by market dynamics alone was woefully incomplete. And the only term to know in regard to that is negative market externality. These are cost values, unaccounted for by the market price equation related to damage done by industry. For example, in the early 21st century, the running price of hydrocarbon energy was in a particular range, but yet there was actually an additional $5.3 trillion in cost every year as people worked to clean up the damage the use of hydrocarbons was doing to the planet. Same for the plastics industry, a serious problem back then. It had an externalized cost of $2.5 trillion a year just to clean up the oceans. In fact, if you went back and did the accounting for global industry as a whole, factoring in these negative market externalities, again, these costs not reflected in the set prices, you would find that no company on the planet was actually even profitable. So of course today, we have a very different system of accounting. We know almost exactly what's happening, or could happen, in downstream effects. And we improve our total system efficiency every single year because of it. It's a true economy, in other words. And all of this creates a very different social atmosphere. Today, our incentives are aligned. No one cuts corners, there's no reason to. No one's trying to improve some bottom line by disregarding our ecological stewardship or the well-being of others. We finally got it right. And I compare the footage of the way people behaved back then to the way they do now, with an astounding amount of pride and community, meaning and purpose. They don't feel alone. They know they have support, not just from their friends and family, but from the very design of the social system itself. A system designed to actually care. Imagine that. I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap this up for now, but as, as we discussed, I will be back for the second part of this interview fairly soon, uh, specifically to discuss the colony of Concordia and their historical influence. Sure. So, what's the name of the documentary? Interreflections. Interesting. But before we end, I, I had a rather strange request. If you could address those vulnerable, confused souls, you know, before the Great Transition, given, as you put it earlier, we barely made it at all, what would you say to them? Wow, that is a strange request. Hmm. I think I would paraphrase the words of a notable civil rights activist from the mid-20th century named Bayard Rustin. And he said, You are all one. And if you don't know it, you're going to find out the hard way.